Let's build that medical brain. How many times did you guys have a patient and the patient's blood pressure is out of control and you say, hey, we got to get a secondary hypertension workup. But how often do you actually do it? You typically say, hey, the PCP is going to do it, right? Or what is truly a secondary hypertension workup? So let's put it this way. First off, in order for you to consider a secondary cause, right? Secondary hypertension, because most of the time hypertension is primary. It's idiopathic. We don't know why it happens. It happens, right? We all agree. But sometimes you think that is secondary reason. When do you start suspecting that? Yes, so basically what you're saying is three drugs. So what you're implying is the patient's hypertension needs to be resistant. Yes, it needs to be resistant in order for you to start suspecting saying, okay, something's missing here because the patient's on three drugs, maxed out on good doses, and the blood pressure is not getting control. So there's a problem. So that's what's important. So how do you define resistant hypertension? Resistant hypertension is if your patient's blood pressure is still greater than 130 over 80, which is your normal target for most patients. If it is still above 130 over 80, despite being on three drugs, which has to be from three different groups. And your three traditional groups you pick from are what? ACE, ARB, GERD. And group number two will be calcium channel blockers such as the dihydropyridines, amlodipine, nifedipine, GERD. And number three must be what? Must be a diuretic. Absolutely must be a diuretic. In order for you to call it resistant, you have to be on three drug groups. It has to be these three and the diuretic must be present. Despite that, if your blood pressure is still above 130 over 80, then you say, hey, this patient's got resistant hypertension. Now, is there another instance when you would consider it to be a resistant hypertension what if you were on four drugs okay you were on four drugs but the blood pressure is now controlled to be less than 130 over 80. you can still consider this a resistant hypertension it's a controlled resistant hypertension right because now you're requiring the fourth drug now you're at target but still you're like why do you need four drugs to get the blood pressure under control. Moment this happens is when you start thinking, hey, I think we need to look into some secondary causes here because something doesn't add up. You should not be needing so many drugs without an absolute explanation. Or if somebody's really young, if a young person develops hypertension, but again, hypertension, blood pressure being 130 over 80 and not requiring drug therapy won't bring the suspicion. We all agree, right? Hypertension can start at a young age too. But clearly, we can all agree that resistant hypertension presence is what's going to open up the real spectrum of conditions for you to start looking into it. That's number one. Now, once you call it resistant hypertension, let's broadly fill out the board with all the different conditions that is probably going to cause secondary hypertension and therefore requires dedicated workup. Okay? What's the number one cause for secondary hypertension? Well, there is some data to support that now, but overall it has always been what? What's that? CKD? Yes, it is actually chronic, or we can call it kidney disease. The number one cause, okay, is going to be kidney disease. Now, when I say kidney disease, what does that mean? What kidney disease? It could be anything. Most of the time, if somebody's got diabetes, and they have diabetic nephropathy, that's a kidney disease, right? Or if somebody's got some form of hypertensive arteriolosclerosis, that makes it a kidney disease. If somebody's got glomerulonephritis or nephrotic syndrome, right? Or some injury to the kidney over time due to whatever, all of that will come under kidney disease. So kidney disease is not really a specific condition, but rather a big constituent that encompasses a multiple different things that could lead to kidney disease. But why would kidney disease lead to hypertension to begin with though? Imagine you knock your kidney off, right? For whatever reason, like I said. If you damage your kidney, why would your blood pressure go up? Yes, because whenever you damage the kidney, you're going to affect the renal function, right? 
So eventually what's going to happen is you're going to stimulate, you will have decreased perfusion to the kidney. And if you have decreased perfusion to the kidney, you're going to activate your RAS. So whenever it comes to secondary hypertension, you need to know that the RAS involvement is very profound, right? So from a kidney standpoint, it is essentially because of RAS stimulation due to the kidney itself getting affected and your perfusion is affected, so you will stimulate your RAS system. What else for causes? Number two, this does not have to go in order. We just have to think about all the different conditions that can cause secondary hypertension. What are some big ones? Hyperaldosteronism. Very good. Hyperaldosteronism, good, is there are some data now to prove that actually hyperaldosteronism is one of the most common cause in a patient's age group less than 40. There is some data to support that. So it's very, very common in that sense. Okay. What else? Cushing. Yes. Number three, you can put Cushing's syndrome. Okay. What else? Theochromocytoma. Very good. Theochromo. Cytoma, good. What else? You're including renal artery stenosis. I haven't yet. Okay. Renal when I say kidney disease, I don't mean renal artery stenosis. So renal artery stenosis, absolutely. Renal artery stenosis, yes. What else? What about hyperthyroidism? Yeah. Yes. Hyper. Thyroidism, good. And lastly, drugs. If people are taking any form of drugs, you know, abusive drugs and whatnot, you can have a drug induced hypertension. Okay? Now, these are your most common causes for secondary hypertension workup, and you need to know all of this completely, both for clinical practice as well as for the board exams. Okay? Now, do you blindly test for all of these on all your patients? No, you don't. If they have features suggestive of that, then you go after it. You don't blindly test them all for these features. Maybe one thing you can do is get a renal ultrasound, a basic renal ultrasound to see if they got kidney disease. If you have medial kidney disease, that's fair. You can get a basic creatinine. So as a baseline test, you can get labs when somebody's hypertensive and you're centering secondary hypertension. You will get a BMP and you can look at the patient's creatinine, right? Because because the kidney disease element is so important because it's very common. So you look for it, right? The creatinine being high can imply could there be a kidney disease and you can actually do a renal ultrasound to see if there is some renal pathology present. But other than that, for all of these causes, you need to absolutely individualize it, okay? So now let's talk about every single condition and crack it down to the fullest. Yes? Okay. Our diagnosis in question is going to be Cushing syndrome. Now we all know that Cushing syndrome patient is going to have very unique features to suggest Cushing syndrome, right? Such as what? Hump. Buffalo hump, moon-like faces, abdominal distension, striae, thin extremities, and they'll also be hyperglycemic and they're going to have hypertension. So whenever you have a secondary hypertension patient, you will look at the patient and say, hey, does this patient have features suggestive of Cushing syndrome or not, right? Not just because of hypertension, you're gonna go this path. So the moment you say, okay, this patient's got some features suggestive of Cushing syndrome, so we should work this up. This is the absolute perfect workup that you need to know for Cushing syndrome. There's nothing more to the story. But once you understand this, this is it. it does not not get better than this. So, if the patient's got Cushing syndrome, we suspect it, right? What is your secondary hypertension workup here? What do you order first? You need to first off say and prove that the patient's got elevated cortisol, right? Because the reason somebody's got Cushing syndrome eventually is because too much cortisol. So you need to prove there's too much cortisol, right? How are you going to do that? You're going to order three tests. One, two, and three. First test is going to be Yes, you can do a 24-hour urinary cortisol level. Good. Or you can do 11 p.m. salivary cortisol, which is a test. So 24-hour urine cortisol is when you check the cortisol in the patient's urine over 24 hours. Okay. 
when it comes to your 11 p.m. late night salivary cortisol test, it's at 11 p.m., two consecutive nights, you take a swab, you put it in the saliva, and you pack it up and you send it to the lab. They will check the cortisol level on it. If it is elevated, it tells this hypercortisolism. Now, that test can get affected quite a bit if the patient's sleep cycle is messed up. Like if people are working night shift, like when you're doing residency and you do night shift, it messes up your sleep cycle and that affects your cortisol. So you have to take it with a big you know, grain of salt here that shift workers, that will be affected. People who smoke, that will be affected. People who take inhalational steroids or oral steroids, it can get affected, right? But you can do 11 p.m. salivary cortisol times two consecutive days. And number three is gonna be a low dose dexamethasone suppression test. What you do, you give one milligram of dexamethasone at what time? 11 p.m. at night and in the morning, 8 a.m., you'll check cortisol levels, right? And your cortisol typically should be suppressed. If you give steroids, you should suppress your cortisol. But if it is not suppressed, and in fact, your cortisol is elevated, right? All of these three things is basically proving our point saying, hey, there's too much cortisol. We've proven it, right? How many of these tests are you going to order? In order for you to prove patients got hypercortisolism, you typically need two tests to be positive. So most of these patients, you'll end up ordering all three. So if you have a high likelihood or a high suspicion for Cushing syndrome, you need two to be positive to rule in. Similarly, if your suspicion is high and you want to rule out, you still need two. Two to be negative to rule out. The only time you can get away with just one test being negative is if your suspicion was low. Okay? But most of the time, you will order all three tests because you will need two of them to be positive to prove it. Make sense? So that's just one part of the story, right? So once your patient's cortisol is elevated, you've said now, well, the cortisol is high. What's the next step? Let's think about it. If you're thinking of a patient with Cushing syndrome, it's either a problem with your pituitary gland or it's a problem with your adrenal gland or it's a problem with your lung with a mass. End of the day, right? What is the most common cause for somebody developing Cushing syndrome? It's us. You guys are the reason for people getting steroids. Cushing syndrome. Steroids, right? Whenever you give people steroids, they can get Cushing syndrome. That's why you always want to make sure patients do not stay on cortisol or any form of steroid for a long period of time. But if you take that out of the equation, okay? Take us not being the problem, okay? In a world like that, then you come to say, okay, if I got Cushing syndrome, I either got a problem with my pituitary gland, or I got a problem with my adrenal gland, or it's lung. Where is cortisol produced from? From the adrenal gland, right? So typically, your hypothalamus produces CRH, which stimulates ACTH to be produced from your pituitary gland, and that's going to stimulate your adrenal gland to produce cortisol, right? When it comes to a adrenal pathology, what are you producing too much of? Cortisol, right? So ACTH is going to come stimulate this to produce cortisol and cortisol is typically going to have what? A negative feedback on ACTH, right? So once you've proven that the cortisol level is elevated, what's the rightful next step to do? If your cortisol is elevated, what's your rightful next step? Yes, but the way you're going to, it's three things, right? What does your adrenal gland produce? Produces cortisol. What does pituitary produce? ACTH. What does a lung cancer produce? ACTH. So two of them are producing ACTH, whereas the adrenal gland is producing cortisol. When you produce too much cortisol from the adrenal gland, is that going to suppress ACTH? Yes. But both of this, your ACTH is going to be? Hi. So your rightful next step after seeing cortisol is elevated is going to be ACTH. Okay, you get ACTH level. And if your ACTH level is low, if your ACTH is low, what does it mean? It most likely means it is an adrenal origin. So what's your next step then? Is to get imaging. You get an imaging with either CT of the abdomen or a MRI of the abdomen. And what are you looking for is an adrenal adenoma, okay? You're looking for an adrenal adenoma that's producing steroids, okay?
Now, if your ACTH is elevated, what does that mean? Very good. If the ACTH is elevated, it means it's pituitary all long. What's your next step? How do you differentiate between the two? This is where the change has happened over the past year. Because previously we used to do something else, but now it is different. We do not do the high dose dexamethasone suppression test here anymore. The reasoning is this. When you compare a pituitary source versus lung cancer, which is more common? Pituitary is way more common. Okay? Your pituitary tumor is way more common when your ACTH level is elevated. Okay? And whenever you have a pituitary adenoma, what do you call that? You call it Cushing's disease. Okay? You call it Cushing's disease. So the moment your ACTH level is elevated, you can automatically at that point say, hey, this patient, unless proven otherwise, has a pituitary adenoma. You can forget about the lung for now. Okay? You can be that certain. So given that the case, the moment your ACTH is elevated, what's your next step? You want to image the brain. Okay? The moment your ACTH level is elevated, your next step is to get a MRI brain. Why? Because that's a high likelihood of having Cushing's disease. And what you're looking for is a pituitary adenoma. Okay? So your rightful next step becomes MRI. Say you do the MRI and the MRI shows the tumor, you got the answer. It's a pituitary adenoma and it's Cushing's disease. Great. But what if the MRI is negative? Do you want to do a CT of the lung? Because no could you have a microadenoma of the pituitary gland that is so small that you don't capture it on MRI? Yes, you can. So just because you don't see a Cushing's disease or you don't see a tumor on your MRI does not rule out a pituitary source still. Okay? So what do you do? So if your MRI is negative, what's your rightful next step? You will do something known as an inferior petrosal sinus sampling. You will do an in inferior petrosal sinus sampling. Basically what happens is you check ACTH levels in the inferior petrosal sinus. Okay, All the ACTH is supposed to spill over there. And you will have an elevated ACTH level in the inferior petrosal sinus will imply presence of a pituitary source. But let me ask you this. Is that testing just the inferior petrosal sinus good enough? Every view builds your brain. Locked in yet? Watch it again.